It's great to welcome to the program today Peter Pomerantsev, who is a contributing editor at the American Interest and director of the Arena program at the London School of Economics. He's author most recently of the book This Is Not Propaganda, Adventures in the War Against Reality, Reality as well as other books, some of which I've previously uh, recommended to my audience. So it's great to talk to you, Peter. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for the recommendations. That's really kind of you. So to start with, uh, give the audience a bit of your background uh, in Russia and the places you've lived, because I think that's a big part of your insight into what we'll be talking about. Sure. I mean, like from a family point of view, my parents were Soviet dissidents. Um, they ran into trouble with the KGB in the 1970s and ended up being exiled, which was quite common at the time. And I ended up growing up in London. Um, then after 2001, after university, I went back to Russia and um, uh, ended up working in television, actually, um, kind of in entertainment television, uh, making reality shows and, and factual entertainment shows and all these uh, terrible, terrible things. Um, but that gave me a lot of insights about kind of the development of the Putin propaganda model, because I was kind of working near the belly of the beast, maybe not inside of it, but not far away from it. And um, I wrote my first book about that, trying to define the way that the Putin regime uses propaganda in this very, very, you know, I, pretty original way. Um, and then, of course, what's happened since then is that, you know, the t techniques that were honed inside of Russia have been used for foreign influence campaigns. Um, and my second book kind of looks at kind of propaganda across the world and how it's changing and thinks about why Russia is particularly adept at playing the contemporary game. And now I, you know, I run this little think tank at the London School of Economics, which which studies that and thinks about how we overcome some of the challenges of disinformation, of polarization and the other pathologies that I'm sure your your kind of viewers and listeners are, are more than aware of. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess let's start with that in, in the last five to seven years or, you know, in, in, in re the last decade, maybe. Are there ways in which what we are seeing in the West reminds you of the Russian techniques that were not as visible in the West more than a decade ago? Sure. I mean, even even you can go back to the 1990s and you see these things develop there. Um, I think a lot of it is actually cultural rather than just technical. I mean, hmm. this idea, this focus on nostalgia rather than an idea of the future, um, this kind of post left right moments, um, kind of post ideological moments where policies and sort of rational arguments become much less important and all politics just becomes about capturing some sort of feeling. I mean, feelings were always present in politics, but now the feeling becomes everything. Um, this constant redefinition of the people and the non-people is kind of 21st century version of, of, of populism. Um, this constant kind of like, you know, um, mixing of different messages uh, to different audiences, the, the, the lack of any kind of coherence uh, for a lot of political successful political movements, uh, and perhaps most importantly, this idea that you can't hold power accountable with the truth anymore, this uh, um, bizarre place we're in where politicians kind of revel in lying and, and even make a thing out of it um, and show complete disdain for factuality and factual language. Um, all, all of that was really evident in, in Russia already in the 1990s for reasons I explore in the book. Um, then there's also the technical side, the kind of uh, the use of... Um, you know, uh, the use of, of troll farms, or online mobs and cyber militias. And that's something the Kremlin's already playing with in 2010 um, as a way to respond to, to you know, uh, kind of the democratic, democratic use of the Internet. Um, so, 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 yeah, Russia's been a, somewhat of a pioneer in these things, um, partly because it lost the Cold War. By losing the Cold War, they ended up in a place in the 1990s where kind of all old versions of the future of left and right politics, of the def of social definitions have collapsed. Um, and so political technologists, that's a Russian kind of term for propagandists, and politicians start experimenting with how to survive in this kind of in, in this new world. Yeah. So I want to dig into that a little bit, because there are many in the West who know the techniques, but they don't necessarily know the genesis and what catalyzed those techniques to be pioneered in Russia, as you're pointing out. And it's very easy to just say, ah, they're just evil or, you know, it's conniving Putin or the, these very simplistic explanations. So can you talk a little bit more about what were the circumstances that led to Russia being the place where a lot of these techniques were pioneered? Well, they, as often, actually, historically, by 
because they lost the Cold War and then because democratic capitalism kind of collapsed as any kind of coherent ideology by 1993 in Russia, with sort of absolutely disastrous consequences for reforms, um, they were kind of left in this vacuum. Um, and there was no idea of the future left. So making kind of fact-based arguments about the future um, became, became pointless. Hmm. Uh, so instead, there was a reveling in nostalgia. Um, and I interview a lot of these kind of spin doctors who were operating Russia in the 1990s. And they're like, look, we couldn't make any kind of coherent policy arguments anymore because all the coherent rational policies were making people unhappy. Uh, so instead, we just focused on uniting people around a vague feeling, you know, bringing Russia off its knees, which obviously sort of anticipates making America great again. So, so that's kind of the cultural moment. Um, but also you have this kind of understanding that, look, you can't do, we're living in kind of an increasingly fractured world, an increasingly fractured environment. And, and you win by really targeting different messages at different groups in very honed and specific ways. Um, and, and, you know, in the early 2000s, which is when I was in Russia, I mean, that was so remarkable about that version of Putin, the way he would sort of completely transform for different audiences. Um, so, you know, they'd sell the far left one version of Putin, the far right another one. Um, and not even ideology, just interest groups. Here's your what thing and here's your thing. And it didn't need to come together into a coherent whole in a political ideological sense, but it only had to make sense, um, again, by uniting around a very vague theme that anybody could interpret their own way. Um, so, so, you know, what we see Russia doing abroad since then is, you know, masterfully really finding completely contradictory audiences, whether it's um, the far left in Britain or the far right in the U.S., uh, and sort of like, you know, dragging them in to the Kremlin's you know, uh, web and interests. Um, so, so, you know, kind of the, the techniques honed inside the country have proven very um, useful abroad. But, but I wouldn't overestimate Russia's kind of influence on things. I mean, and they can only play, you know, play a sort of a, a tactical game. I mean, what, what, what's much more important is, is that we're seeing Western countries, and especially America, arrived culturally at a very similar place that Russia arrived to in the 1990s. I mean, we can think of many reasons why all kind of versions of left and right politics collapsed, why all versions of the future collapsed for enough people. Um, 2008 crisis, the sense that people's children are going to be poorer than them. We can, we can talk about many, many factors. Um, but, but in many ways, you know, America culturally uh, has arrived to Russia in the early 1990s. Um, Maybe not politically, of course, or in the sense of its institutions or in, you know, its, its court systems and, or, and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm kind of talking about, like, the political culture, um, uh, kind of the, 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 uh, uh, the, the permafrost underneath the, uh, the institutions is melting in a very similar way. When you think back to the time where some of these techniques were were maybe in, in their heyday, so to speak, and not to suggest that they've diminished, but maybe when when they were more prevalent in a particular uh, a way, how did they or did they affect the personal and family lives of Russians? We have sort of a sense, you know, in North Korea of the way that North Korean propaganda is woven into the daily lives with the speaker you can't turn off with the speeches and, and sort of these other ways. But how how, if at all, did the daily lives of Russians uh, uh, change by virtue of these techniques that started being used domestically? Now listen, I mean, in that sense, Russia is not like North Korea, not like the Soviet Union. It has um, when I was there, it still had sort of the last vestiges of pluralism. Um, but at the end of the day, you can get information from the West online very, very easily. Hmm. Um, there's no kind of like Soviet style or North Korean style censorship. You can leave the country. Uh, so in that sense, a much more open system. And what the Kremlin did was realize that, look, instead of trying to censor the space, they would flood it with so much information, disinformation. People couldn't find a way through this murky world anymore. In this dark, chaotic world, um, you turn to strong leaders uh, to kind of uh, to guide you. Um, and they began to use conspiracy thinking uh, and cynicism as a kind of quasi replacement for ideology. Uh, conspiracies, you know, weren't just uh, a way to sort of explain the world, but the propaganda pushed out n nonstop the sense that the truth is unknowable, that we live in this, you know, dark, dark world where um, 
conspiracy is layered on conspiracy and layered on conspiracy. Uh, and in this confusing world, you can't believe in anything. Everything is corrupt. Democracy in the West is rigged. Uh, and you need a strong Putin to protect you. And, you know, it's remarkable seeing how effective that is. I mean, we now see that across the world. Uh, in Turkey, in Yugoslavia, in former Yugoslavia, and of course in America, where you know you have a leadership that maybe they believe in some of the conspiracy theories, which is really scary, but they definitely use conspiracy theories uh, all the time. Again, to give people the sense that the truth is unknowable. Um, I mean, that's a big difference between 21st century propaganda and 20th century propaganda. It's not trying to convince people of a truth. It's trying to seed so much doubt that people just lose the will to struggle and live in a political sense. Yeah, I've said and that it's much more, even though people like to say that it's like 1984, it's actually much more like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World in that sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think I think there is still a lot to learn from Orwell without sure. a doubt. But but uh, maybe Huxley is, is, is the better uh, is the better guide. Um, but, but it's I mean, this is something that the Kremlin did early and out of a sense of crisis. I was like, OK, we can't impose censorship. What do we do? How do we impose what um, this Russian media critic Vasily Gartov calls white jamming? Just confuse people so much and make them feel that uh, you know they can't change anything because that's a, you know that's the nasty little thing about this conspiracy thinking. If you live in a world full of dark conspiracies, full of deep states, and full of you know endless media plots, then that means you, the little guy, can't change anything. It's a wonderfully clever way of demotivating people and undermining their democratic potential. Um, the Kremlin kind of turned to it out of desperation. You know, they kind of like, they had nothing else to work with because imposing censorship, you know, that really, you know, total censorship is, is really hard nowadays. Um, but I see it now used across the world. Um, and, and it's used in mature democracies as well, which is very, very disturbing. One of the things that I see uh, skeptics of Russian meddling in the US repeat very often here in the United States uh, are sort of isolated counterpoints about where the current administration's actions appear not to line up cleanly with Russian interests. And what I feel like is missing from these analyses is an understanding of the level of sophistication and nuance that goes into a, a lot of these techniques that are being used by Putin, where it's not about uh, on any particular issue necessarily. Um, getting the immediate uh, alignment on policy, but it is about what you're talking about, sowing the doubt, destabilizing some of the main uh, systems that are used to make policy in the first place, um, making people question whether the, the democratic system is is properly working as designed. Can you talk a little bit about the, the level of nuance that is needed mm -hmm. to understand that just looking at, well, Trump bombed Syria, so therefore, that that's just not deep enough to really understand the level at which these techniques operate. Yeah, I mean, Trump, I mean, Trump's pulled out of Syria. So that, that's complete alignment. With yes, Russia, it's completely Russia reversed, takes. of course. But, since, you know, since that, yeah. look, look, Russia had already boxed. I mean, Russia already had a bomber's kind of game in Syria. So that that wasn't um, I don't think that's what they were looking at. No. Um, look, from what look, we're speculating about what their game plan was, but we assume given on really the bits of evidence that we have that the aim was to see doubt. So to push up uh, Trump as much as they could, assuming Hillary would win, but then, you know, getting readying this narrative that it was rigged, you know, that the system's rigged, that, you know, Trump lost because the other side cheated. Um, it's that sowing doubt, which which is kind of the meta narrative all the time. That's the meta narrative that they use at home. Basically, you know, they don't say that they're, you know, nobody in Russia claims that it's a healthy democracy or that it's not corrupt. Their argument is, well, the West is just as corrupted as, as us. Yeah, the whole world is rotten. So, so we assume that was it. You know, that was the kind of the game plan. And then Trump went and won. Um, and and well, that was a bit of a, you know, that may have that may have. You know, that may have been as stunning to them as to us. So um, we don't know. But look, Trump aligns with the Kremlin in a very deep way. Um, which is in his deep, deep cynicism. You know, when Trump, Trump, you know, recently we had transcripts uh, from 2016 where Trump sort of tells the Russians, look, I don't mind what you did in the US because the US government does the same sort of thing. That kind of equivalence um, is is the essence of kind of the Putin anti-ideology. Yeah. Um, and the and, other thing that seems powerful yeah. in that, it seems to me, is that very often the conspiratorial ideas 
do have an element of truth in the sense that, for example, the idea that the system is rigged and democracy may not be functioning as designed. That's something a lot of people on the American left have been saying for a long time, but in different ways than than became the talking point after the 2016 election. And that's probably something that helps these ideas self perpetuate in society when there, there is an element of truth to them, but the details are going completely awry. Well, all good propaganda does that. I mean, it always mixes truth and fiction or takes a good idea and then pushes it to sort of an absurd and destructive conclusion. But look, I think it's quite a simple sort of dividing line. There is a difference between constructive, you know, policy suggestions, which should be based on criticism. That's fine. And a kind of cynicism which says our oh, democracy is impossible full stop. Therefore, you know, every system is rigged. Therefore, you know, we should just leave the world open to you know, to to strong men and no, all, all values are, all universal values are just a charade. So therefore let's have a zones of influence where every country makes up their own, value, you know, their own system of norms and human rights are just a myth. So I think, I think, look, it's, there's a difference between, you know, a criticism that, that's meant to strengthen democracy and, and, uh, uh, and you can tell that usually by the, by, by the speech, the nature of the speech, because it invites argument and genuine debate. Um, you know, there's lots of theories of democracy. We talk about that. It's, it's the nature of the conversation that's important. And this kind of conspiratorial cynicism, which ends any conversation because it says, well, everything's rigged. Therefore, there's nothing to talk about. So I don't, I don't find it very hard to differentiate between the two. And I think most people, if they think about it, wouldn't find that very hard either. Mm. But, but maybe on a certain kind of momentary level, um, you can fall for this kind of arty nonsense. But I, I really don't think people do. I mean, I hope not, because that's so depressing. To what degree do you see as what's going on in the UK with Boris Johnson as tracking some of what is happening in the US? Similarities, differences? So listen, look, the way I encourage people to, to talk about what I'm talking about, which is sort of political culture, propaganda as in the formation of public opinion. Yes. Um, political rhetoric, which are the things that, that I'm interested in. Look, I, I compare it to art. I mean, art is very similar in the same way that it kind of manifests itself in similar ways in different countries. So you have you know, in the turn of the 20th century, you have modernism in, in Russia I and mean, in the Soviet Union, uh, what became the Soviet Union, uh, in America and Britain. Um, so you have these common phenomena break out because that's that's the zeitgeist. Um, they all manifest themselves in national idioms. You know, so they're going to be very, very different in Britain to America because they're different countries. But without a doubt, Boris Johnson is someone who's been caught lying, who lost his job as a journalist because he lied. And that hasn't stopped him succeeding. He's someone also sort of peddling nostalgia nonstop. So there are clear motifs that repeat. Um, we've moved away. I mean, Brexit was a move away from left and right politics uh, or centrist politics, which is the way you know, attempt to marry this to, to pure emotions, targeted messaging and a kind of uh, creation of the people. You know, it's, it's not a populism isn't an ideology. It's a strategy. It's a creation of an idea of the people or a sense of the people for every election. So that's 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 the similarity. But then there are a million differences. I mean, Johnson, unlike Trump, is, is not a, you know, he's a highly educated man, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and probably a very different kind of dinner companion to Trump. Um, so there are huge differences as well. Um, but no, no, there's, there's some sort of zeitgeist. I mean, we see it in the Philippines of Duterte with Orban. I mean, it's not a coincidence that all these people are also men of a certain age. You know, there's, there's a lot of similarities. Um, in my book, I took a lot about their language, this obsession with, kind of jokes about human private parts, about, you know, like dirty jokes, how all of them uh, indulge in this language. And what does that mean? Uh, what does that say about us? We've been talking uh, somewhat about uh, what is in the book. This is not propaganda adventures in the war against reality and about many other things with the book's author, Peter Pomerantsev, who's a contributing editor at the American interest and also directs the arena program at LSC. Peter, so great having you on. I really appreciate your time. It's my pleasure. Um, anytime.